Tonight, we will hear from three great panelists, Dr. Austin Larson from Children's Hospital of Colorado, Lucas Berger from Probably Genetic, and our very own Dr. Philip Yeski, UMDF's Science and Alliance Officer. Our Ask the Mito Doc webcasts are made possible through the generosity of sponsors. So we ask that you join us in thanking Edith Trees Charitable Trust and Zogenics for their ongoing support. Every month, UMDF provides an important resource, virtual support meetings. We invite you to scan here or visit the UMDF calendar for upcoming meetings. Join us from the comfort of, comfort of your own home for virtual support. Also, make sure you check out MitoU. This is a great resource for patient families in our scientific and medical community. It provides you with helpful information on diagnosis, treatments, and will be continually updated with informational videos for your viewing, including the archives of these Ask the Mito Doc webcasts. UMDF is pleased to continue the advancement of research while supporting our patient community. The highly anticipated MitoShare is now in beta testing with public launch coming soon. If you haven't seen our clinical trials page, make sure you check it out and trial the Mito Clinical Trials Finder. Explore and find the right trial for you at www.umdf.org slash clinical dash trials. UMDF also recently launched a pilot genetic testing program. This is a pilot program and based on the responses so far, very much needed in our community. Learn more about this new program at www.umdf.org slash testing. We are excited about Mitochondrial Medicine 2022, live in Phoenix, Arizona, this coming June. Take a look at your calendar and save the dates. And make sure you visit www.umdf.org slash symposium and go ahead and reserve your hotel room. You want to make sure you get a room and join us in June. Spring is not too far away to start thinking about participating in a walk near you. Walk your way this spring, safely. Find a walk location near you and walk your way at energyforlifewalk.org. We know you're seeking answers and UMDF is always here to educate in difficult times and provide helpful resources and offer caring support. We can connect you with our patient concierge or you can contact our support line at 888-900-6486 and our patient concierge representative will connect you with a local MITO family or a UMDF support ambassador from our national network of volunteers. Before we hear from our panel, we have some housekeeping items for you. We have muted the lines, so if during this webcast you have a question, please use the Q&A button to type in your questions so that we can get answers for you. We ask that you keep your questions short for this webcast. We may not be able to answer questions that are too personal or detailed for this forum. Also, please note the information about the closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. Looking ahead next month, we will hear from Drs. Amel Kara and Philip Yeski about the power of the patient voice. Registries is just one way, but much more will be shared as we learn how important the patient voice can be in finding better treatments and cures. Watch your email and social media for ways to register and submit your questions. Now it's time to get started, and Dr. Philip Yeski, our moderator this evening, will assist our first speaker. Hello, everybody. Uh, Philip Yeski, a uh, pleasure to be here with you at this Ask the Mito Doc February 2022 uh, episode. Um, as you heard in the uh, introduction, we're going to focus on genetic testing uh, tonight. Uh, so we have a, a great presentation by Dr. Austin Larson, uh, Children's Hospital, Colorado. Um, and then I will follow up with uh, Lucas Berger uh, from Probably Genetic to tell you a little bit more about our pilot genetic testing program. Um, so uh, I really hope you enjoy the, the presentations, but uh, we're very much interested in hearing from you. So we encourage your questions. Use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Submit your questions. 
we'll do the best we can to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, we do ask to, to the extent possible to keep them on topic uh, so that we can really explore genetic testing and what it means inside of mitochondrial disease, a really important topic. And as said, we'll, we'll do the best we can to get to as many as possible. So I think with that, I'm gonna uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Austin Larson, uh, who's gonna give us a, a little breakdown on understanding uh, genetic uh, testing. So Austin, please take it away. Thanks, Phil. Uh, and thank you, Kara. Uh, thank you all for being here. So uh, my name is Austin Larson. I'm a physician. I'm a pediatrician, a medical geneticist, biochemical geneticist, and um, my practice really is primarily about the intersection of genetic testing and mitochondrial disease. So this is a topic that's really important to me and a topic that's becoming increasingly important in the mitochondrial community and one that I'm excited to tell you more about tonight. So the first question on this topic is, why is genetic testing important? What is the role that it plays in the care of an individual mitochondrial patient, but also the mitochondrial community in general? So uh, there's a, a number of important things that genetic testing can do. One of the really important things that can result from a genetic diagnosis is a specific treatment. So I'm thinking of um, some patients that I've cared for. Uh, for example, um, I, uh, I care for a young patient who <clears throat> was uh, uh, identified by her community neurologist. Um, she had uh, genetic testing on the basis of a symptom of kind of recurrent episodes of low muscle tone and um, transient loss of, of skills. And uh, the, the neurologist wasn't sure what she had, but felt uh, compelled to send genetic testing. Uh, and it turned out that she had a condition called pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, that's a condition that in some cases, depending on the particular manifestations, can respond to ketogenic diet. So this patient was started on ketogenic diet as a direct result of having had a genetic diagnosis, and uh, she has done much, much better uh, with that management. Another patient that comes to mind for me was a, an adult patient who uh, began to develop symptoms of ptosis and ophthalmoplegia. Um, she had a brain MRI done, which showed uh, leukodystrophy or changes in the white matter of the brain MRI. Um, she had seen a, a number of different providers who uh, we're not able to identify a specific um, clinical diagnosis. She eventually had whole exome sequencing. She was diagnosed with uh, what's called thymidine phosphorylase deficiency, um, also known as Mingi. And um, she eventually was treated with a liver transplantation, um, which has stopped the progression of her symptoms. Um, so in some cases, there are very specific treatments that can result from a genetic diagnosis being found for a patient. Another really important role of genetic testing is um, identifying the, um, the right patients to be participating in a clinical trial. So uh, this is a topic that we talk about more and more um, at the UMDF, which is, uh, which is great. Um, so there's, there's more and more resources going into the development of pharmaceuticals specific to mitochondrial disease. But um, one, of the, one of the really important things about running a clinical trial is to be certain that uh, the mechanism of the therapy that you're testing is appropriate for the patients that are entered into the clinical trial. Uh, and so one of the ways that, uh, that we can make certain that the, the right um, patients are able to participate in the right trials is to have uh, genetic diagnoses. Another thing that um, may be a little bit less intuitive is that um, there's a lot of patients for whom mitochondrial disease is a possible diagnosis. Um, there are even some folks who have had a clinical diagnosis of mitochondrial disease, 
And uh, then when uh, sensitive or broad genetic testing is uh, able to be conducted, um, it turns out they may have an alternative diagnosis. Uh, in some cases, that alternative diagnosis, while not a mitochondrial disease, may have a different specific therapy. So uh, I'm thinking of some patients that I've cared for who um, ended up having a diagnostic uh, genetic result with a, a change uh, in a gene that's called a channelopathy. So channelopathies, those are genetic diagnoses uh, where there's dysfunction of a, an ion channel in the brain, and that's uh, the basis of symptoms. In some cases, there are pharmaceutical therapies that alter the, the function of those channels, and uh, those can be effective for patients with uh, a few of those specific channelopathy diagnoses. So it's really important, uh, even in the setting of a uh, clinical diagnosis of possible mitochondrial disease, to think broadly and to think about potential alternative diagnoses, especially alternative diagnoses that may have specific treatments. Another really critical piece of the value of genetic testing is to answer the question of the potential for recurrence in a family. So um, the potential for recurrence can vary widely uh, based on different genetic mechanisms. Um, in some cases, the risk of recurrence may be as high, it may be approaching 100% in the case of uh, a mitochondrial DNA mutation that uh, appears to be really prevalent in the, uh, the egg cells or the oocytes of, of a mother who may have multiple children uh, with uh, mtDNA or mitochondrial DNA-based uh, diagnoses. On the other end of the spectrum, um, a lot of the patients that we diagnose have what's called a de novo mutation, uh, meaning it's a new genetic change that occurred in the child, uh, was not inherited from either parent, and therefore the recurrence risk is very low. So that's a very, very different um, rate of recurrence for those two different scenarios, and um, that can be really important information for a family to have. Um, Lastly, I'll, I'll mention um, the, uh, the idea of finding mitochondrial disease in unlikely places. So I run a, a mitochondrial clinic and um, more and more of the patients that I see are diagnosed based on genetic testing that uh, originates outside of a genetics clinic, maybe even outside of a neurology clinic. Um, and that kind of democratization of genetic testing is uh, meaning that people like a, an endocrinologist in the community who cares for folks with diabetes is identifying a lot of patients with mitochondrial disease. Uh, people in audiology, for example, a, an ear, nose, and throat physician um, might be a, an important uh, source of mitochondrial diagnoses. And when I say unlikely places, um, I'm, I'm referring to different clinics, but the, um, the infrastructure of genetic testing or the, the samples that we can use for genetic testing are quite flexible. Um, in a lot of cases, we can do a, a cheek swab and the DNA that's obtained from that cheek swab is pretty stable. So uh, for example, I care for families where there are family members in Africa or South America, and we've been able to ship a genetic testing kit to those parts of the world. This, the folks have been able to collect a sample and ship it back to us for testing. Um, so that's very different from needing a, say, a specialized MRI or um, a biopsy, um, specialized equipment to do biochemical testing. That, uh, that genetic testing paradigm can be very flexible and very robust for different um, use cases and different scenarios. So when we talk about genetic testing, it's very important to differentiate the mitochondrial DNA from the nuclear DNA. And um, these two different types of DNA have different properties. And that means that they need different approaches to genetic testing. So um, there are some tests that encompass both mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA. Um, but sometimes we need to kind of separate them out and test them, them separately. So 
This is a, a schematic representation of a cell. This blue sphere right here is the nucleus. And in the nucleus are two copies of most of the genes that help to, to run the cell and, and run the body. Um, that is about 20,000 protein coding genes. And um, when you do genetic testing, there's really only three, there, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, there are three possibilities. Uh, either both copies of a gene are affected by a mutation, one of the two copies of the gene is affected, or neither of the copies of the gene are affected. So it's really just three scenarios. Um, because of that, we can test the nuclear genes very broadly. And we can look to see whether half of the uh, reads that we get from that DNA show a mutation or 100% or 0%. Um, by contrast, as opposed to the two copies of all of the nuclear genes, the mitochondrial genome has about 3,000 copies per cell. And some cells can have as many as several hundred thousand copies of mitochondrial DNA. So because uh, you have so many copies of the mitochondrial DNA, uh, you introduce another variable, which is called heteroplasmy. So heteroplasmy is, is the idea that it's not just 0%, 50%, or 100% of the DNA that's affected. It can be anything in between, 1%, 37%, 82%, 99%. And so the techniques that we use to study mitochondrial DNA and to get uh, accurate genetic diagnoses from mitochondrial DNA uh, include what we call deep sequencing. So deep sequencing is the technique of sequencing that same DNA again and again and again, um, sometimes 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 times so that we can get an accurate sense of what exactly is the percentage of mitochondrial DNA that's affected. So that variable of heteroplasmy is really the main, uh, the main thing that differentiates genetic diagnosis in mitochondrial DNA from nuclear DNA. And that variable of heteroplasmy, to add another wrinkle to it, is not just um, uh, that it's not true for the entire body uniformly. Um, we know that different tissues can have different heteroplasmy for mitochondrial DNA mutations. So someone who's considering genetic testing of the mitochondrial DNA needs to think more carefully about what the sample type is as opposed to nuclear DNA testing. So with nuclear DNA testing, I mentioned sending a, a cheek swab. Um, that's a pretty common approach. Um, other times we'll send a, a blood sample. Um, but when we get into mitochondrial DNA, sometimes that blood sample can give us a, a false negative um, diagnosis. So it can fail to identify a mitochondrial DNA mutation, even though that may be the genetic basis of mitochondrial disease for that patient. So this is just one paper. There are many papers that demonstrate this particular phenomenon of different heteroplasmy in different tissues. So this is a, a large family that was studied in the UK. They have a specific mitochondrial DNA mutation in a gene called MTND5. And uh, there's two different things that they're demonstrating with these figures. So in the upper right, you can see that the younger someone is, the higher the heteroplasmy is for this mitochondrial DNA mutation in blood. So in the folks that are in the first couple of years of life, here's someone at about 45%, here's someone at 75% heteroplasmy in blood. And then as people age, that number drops significantly. And here's someone uh, in their late 30s who uh, does not have any detectable mitochondrial DNA mutation in their blood. Another person in their 70s that doesn't have any detectable mutation in their blood. Um, this bottom panel is a comparison of using different tissues to test mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and they show five different tissues that were tested in various family members, blood, urine, muscle biopsy, buccal swab or cheek swab, and fibroblast or skin sample. 
And the main thing to point out is just that the, uh, the heteroplasmy in blood is almost always lower than in other tissues. And the reason for that is because the blood cells are always competing amongst themselves to um, uh, populate the bone marrow and then populate the, the circulation of blood. And um, those blood cells that have mitochondrial DNA mutations, they uh, get outcompeted by uh, cells that don't have the mutation. So over time, that drives down the uh, apparent heteroplasmy when we test mitochondrial uh, DNA mutations in blood. That buccal swab sample type is a little bit, has uh, some, uh, some of that phenomenon, but not as severely as blood. And muscle biopsy is really the gold standard. So you can almost always find the mutation at the highest heteroplasmy in muscle because uh, the muscle cells are very stable. They don't have rapid turnover. And those mitochondrial DNA variants that are present early in life tend to persist in the muscle and not get outcompeted by other cells. So when we turn away from the mitochondrial DNA testing and to the nuclear DNA testing, um, there's probably three main types of nuclear DNA testing that you've heard about. Uh, one would be what's called a panel, another is whole genome, and another is whole exome sequencing. So whole genome sequencing is uh, the process of generating sequence for almost all of the genetic material that exists. So that is 3 billion letters or bases. Um, most of those bases are not genes. Most of those bases are the spaces between genes. And so this is becoming more and more uh, available on a clinical basis, though it's still not that widely available. It's definitely the most expensive of these three sequencing technologies, but it also has the broadest coverage. Um, whole exome sequencing is a technology where instead of sequencing all of the genetic material, um, we focus these, these red bars that you see here, that's the uh, little runs of sequence, or we, or we call them reads. Um, so these are short reads. These are uh, 100 to 200 bases in a row that we can sequence, and then we reconstruct the, um, the full sequence of a gene using a computer and using the, the reference genome that we've developed over the last couple decades. Um, if we focus our sequencing resources just on the genes and we ignore the areas between genes, then uh, we can provide a test at lower cost. Um, and we can focus our resources, we get more read depth of the genes. And so in some cases, we can identify mutations that uh, whole genome sequencing might miss with its lower read depth. Whole genome sequencing has advantages of um, finding what we call structural variants and copy number variants. Um, those are better detected by whole genome sequencing because there aren't any gaps in coverage. So there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, as a general rule, whole exome sequencing will be much more clinically available um, and in more common usage right now in 2022. Um, I expect that will change over time and over the next several years, we'll gradually move towards more use of whole genome sequencing. Um, the least expensive technology um, that still has very good uh, sensitivity for uh, genes that are relevant for mitochondrial disease is what's called targeted sequencing or panels. Um, panels might focus on a few dozen or a few hundred genes that are most relevant for the specific symptoms that an individual has. And by focusing on those genes, you can get very deep read depths. So you can get a really, really accurate picture of exactly what the sequence is in the genes of interest. And you can also do that test more cheaply. So it's, it's less expensive. The downside is that you lose that um, advantage that I talked about earlier of finding something unexpected. Like, oh, I wasn't thinking of the channelopathy genes for this patient who I thought had mitochondrial disease. So you lose that, that kind of breadth of coverage um, that you get with whole exome and whole genome sequencing. 
So I want to spend the, the last uh, bit of my segment here talking about this idea of the art and the science of genetic testing. So most of what I've been talking about so far is the science, generating the sequence, knowing the right tissue to test, testing blood versus buccal swab versus urine versus muscle biopsy, uh, testing um, the whole genome versus the whole exome versus a panel versus mtDNA. Um, and generating that sequence is, um, it's, it's not easy, but it is, um, it's pretty straightforward. It's something that a lot of labs have a lot of experience in doing now. Uh, the techniques for generating that sequence um, are pretty well established. But the art is uh, both on the side of the lab directors, the folks that are then taking that sequence and deciding what to report out of their lab, what to report to the clinician, and then the medical provider taking that report that they get from the lab and deciding how to interpret the genetic results for the patient and how to, uh, how to make those results actionable, how to take next steps based on what you're seeing. And the big fear when I talk about genetic testing, when I talk with ENT doctors about doing testing for their hearing loss clinic or um, endocrinologists about doing testing in their diabetes clinic or neurologists about doing testing in their movement disorder or neuromuscular clinic, the big concern that everyone has is what to do about a VUS or a variant of uncertain significance. So, that is the, the big thing that is preventing broader implementation of genetic testing, is a, a concern about VUSs um, and how to, how to deal with them. So I think it's helpful to know what a VUS is in some technical detail to kind of demystify it a little bit and maybe, um, maybe give you some idea of how the lab is coming to that conclusion and also what your medical provider might do with that. So what is the lab scientist doing? I showed you a schematic of the mitochondrial DNA testing, the whole exome, the whole genome, the panel test. And so regardless of the test that they do, once they've generated that sequence, it's a computer file, and um, the computer starts to filter the data that it's getting to get that broad data set down to something that's manageable for a human being to interact with and interpret. So uh, one of the things that the computer is doing is comparing the sequence that they generate to the healthy population. Um, right now, we mostly use the, the gold standard is something called NOMAD, which is about 150,000 people who are relatively healthy. Anytime you're looking at 150,000 people, um, you're obviously going to have some variability in uh, the health of those people. But for the most part, those folks are unlikely to have uh, severe early onset mitochondrial disease. And therefore, anything that is common in that general population, you can usually exclude that. Um, you can also do the opposite strategy, which is to look at known mutations, things that have been published, uh, mutations that have been proven to correlate with mitochondrial disease. And so you've ruled out everything that's common. And then if you see something that is a known mutation, that's a pretty easy report to write. So you can say, this is a known mutation. Uh, the people in the lab uh, have some clinical information about the patient that they're testing. And they can say, oh, the patient who was published in the literature with this exact same genetic change had the exact same symptoms. And therefore, we conclude that this is a clinically significant finding. Um, the labs will also use their internal data to flag things that are either common or uncommon in the lab. Um, they'll use computer predictions about what is likely or unlikely to, um, to interfere with the function of a protein in terms of those genetic changes. And then um, they will aggregate all of that data together and more to come to a conclusion about whether something is benign pathogenic or a variant of uncertain significance. And those three terms actually have technical definitions that I won't go into today, but the governing bodies for genetic testing have come together and um, 
put forward a set of criteria that mean that if something is defined as pathogenic, it is highly likely to be clinically significant. If something is defined as benign, it is highly unlikely to be clinically significant. And if it's a variant of uncertain significance, it's in the middle. And in the middle is a very, very broad spectrum. So uh, likely pathogenic or pathogenic means that you're 95% sure or more that a variant is clinically significant. Likely benign means there's less than a 5% chance that it's clinically significant. But everything between 5% and 95% is a variant of uncertain significance. And the lab directors being experienced analysts of genetic data, they might see a genetic variant that they think, you know, there's a 50% or a 70% or an 80% chance that it's of clinical significance. And they have to make a judgment call and they have to use their own internal lab policies about whether that variant of uncertain significance is put into a clinical report and presented to the doctor or other medical provider. So then that medical provider uh, takes that information. If there's a known pathogenic variant, um, the discussion with a patient would be something like, uh, you know, this variant has been seen previously. This is the information that we have about the symptoms of other individuals that have had this particular mutation. Um, you know, as a medical provider, I do consider this to be the uh, basis of all of the symptoms, or sometimes as a medical provider, I might conclude that the genetic diagnosis is only responsible for some of the symptoms, and other symptoms might, might require a different explanation. If it's a variant of uncertain significance, um, I might be able to rely on a second follow-up test to then resolve the uncertainty around that variant. So, uh, for example, um, I saw a, a patient today that had a, a variant of uncertain significance that affected uh, the function of complex four, mitochondrial complex four. So um, my decision-making around that is <clears throat> speaking with the, uh, the lab director that I work with that does functional studies of mitochondria, uh, talking about what's the best tissue that uh, we might be able to um, uh, to obtain for this patient in the least invasive way uh, that we could then assess the functioning of that complex and then come to a conclusion about whether that genetic variant of uncertain significance was uh, truly responsible for the symptoms for this patient or not. Um, in some cases, we don't need that. So uh, there might be something that, according to the official criteria, is a variant of uncertain significance but uh, maybe there's a very, very specific set of circumstances for the, um, for the patient. Um, <clears throat> for example, ptosis, external ophthalmoplegia, and neuropathy. Um, in, that, in the context of a very specific uh, set of symptoms, I may be able to conclude on the basis of the fact that that's a variant of uncertain significance, but it's on the more suspicious side and the, the clinical symptoms of the patient are very specific. If you put those two pieces of data together, you may be able to conclude that you, you have a genetic diagnosis. And then the most important decision that we make as clinicians when we interact with genetic testing is the question of what is, what is hinging on me saying that this is a, a definite diagnosis. So is this a patient that is going to undergo a liver transplant or a bone marrow transplant or a patient that's going to go into a clinical trial on the basis of having a genetic diagnosis? In that case, we need to be really, really sure uh, about the accuracy of that diagnosis. And we may do follow-up testing uh, even if we're almost certain about, um, about a genetic diagnosis, if the stakes are really high, if there's a, uh, an invasive um, or um, risky uh, intervention that might result from having that genetic diagnosis. So each clinical context is different. Um, the folks in the lab 
are um, highly trained. Uh, they're uh, really experienced at uh, interpreting genetic results. But at the end of the day, they often come out with the variant of uncertain significance. And that's just a, an honest representation of the uncertainty that still exists. We're getting better and better with time. Um, we're able to uh, um, define more and more genetic variants as either benign or pathogenic. But for the time being, there's going to be a, a long period where we still have a lot of variants of uncertain significance that then come back to uh, the medical providers and the patient to do some shared decision making about um, saying either, you know, this really, this really doesn't fit. This, um, this maybe is not something to follow up on, or, you know, this is a variant of uncertain significance, but um, because of the specific symptoms that you have, this is highly suspicious as a potential genetic diagnosis. And we need to take the next steps based on that variant of uncertain significance. So there's still a lot of art uh, that's involved in applying genetic testing to the care of individual patients. So um, I'm looking forward to a, a good conversation for the, the second half of the hour. And um, thank you for listening to my, uh, to my talk. Well, thanks, Austin. That uh, was really a, a, a great talk. Um, I think that the take home message was, or, you know, right there <laughs> at the very end, and that's realizing that genetic testing is as much art as it is science. And that might be unsettling, you know, to some in the, in the, in the patient community who might view having a confirmed genetic diagnosis as um, you know, the, the goal, uh, but, uh, and, but it's all about how you get to it. And it sounds like it's also a result that may need to be revisited over time, particularly if you're in that middle area, right, of uncertain significance. Yeah, so we've had a, a lot of great questions submitted already uh, from, from the audience. Um, we're going to hold those uh, to get on the other side of this uh, brief presentation that uh, Lucas Berger and, and I would like to make about the UMDF uh, pilot uh, genetic testing program, no cost genetic testing program. So just give me a second to get my slide up, please. Um, so uh, as I said, uh, just want to briefly talk about the pilot no cost genetic testing program. It's a really exciting program for, for UMDF. We've recognized for a long time the importance of diagnosis. It's, it's one of the three pillars of our roadmap, improving diagnosis, developing treatments and cures, optimizing clinical care. Um, but you know, creating the right program um, took some time to be thoughtful and, and think about how we wanted to launch it. And we were really presented with a wonderful uh, opportunity in this program to have a sponsored um, uh, no-cost genetic testing program. And I just want to kind of go over again. You heard some of this from Dr. Larson as well, but you know, why, why is it so important to get to a diagnosis? And the answer to that is multivariate. There, there's, there's many reasons for it. Uh, it's important to both the patient as well as the research community. And at UMDF, uh, we, we think of the, the patients as the, the most important stakeholders in this process, but we know it's only through research and clinical research in particular that we will get to um, development of treatments and cures. So for the patient, it's well demonstrated, right? That just the comfort of knowing exactly what you're dealing with, what form of disease you have in and of itself has value. So hopefully we can drive diagnoses and that brings some relief to the patient to know, I know what it is. Now we can think about how best to address it. And that's how your clinician can really help you. After a diagnosis, you have access to better medical care because the clinicians know exactly what they're dealing with. And in doing so, they then can make recommendations about proper treatments for your specific form of mitochondrial disease. Lastly, uh, it's the ability to participate in clinical trials. And as I said, if our ultimate shared goal is to develop treatments, cures, and hopefully the treatments and cures for, for mitochondrial disease, uh, it will be through the clinical trial process, and it, it requires a, a commitment and engagement from the patient community. So 
having a confirmed genetic diagnosis is what opens the door to being able to participate in clinical trials to hopefully bring those treatments and cures uh, to our patient community. So how will we do it in this program? Well, it launched back in January, and the concept is for those patients who don't yet have a confirmed genetic diagnosis, perhaps they have a clinical diagnosis, their doctor has talked about a range of symptoms that seem consistent with mitochondrial disease, but haven't yet had genetic testing, um, could be just suspected, right, for, for a number of reasons. These are the ideal candidates to then go to our partner, probably genetic, uh, use their symptom tracker to submit an application. Um, it'll take approximately five, 10 minutes uh, to input some information about the symptoms you're experiencing. Uh, and if selected, uh, would receive a no cost whole exome sequence of just the nuclear DNA. So I think it's important to talk about both what this program's goals are as well as some of the limitations because quite intentionally, we put the word pilot in the program uh, to represent that this is really a, a learning phase, if you will. And we do hope to drive as many diagnoses as possible with the program, but we need to learn about what works well and maybe how to tweak the program if we want to sustain it and make it a, a valuable program for the community long-term. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, in this pilot phase, at least, you do need to be a resident of the United States. We know we've had a, a number of submissions from abroad, and we're very appreciative of you sharing your information about your symptoms. It is of benefit in helping to train the algorithm that's involved with, uh, with this process, but unfortunately, we won't be able to offer a genetic test to you, even if selected. Secondly, we really want to reserve this this pilot phase for those who haven't had prior uh, whole exome or whole genome sequencing. We know that many have just had muscle biop biopsies or perhaps a panel in the past, absolutely eligible. But if you've had whole exome or whole genome, we don't want to use this program as somewhat of a confirmatory process to just go through that uh, once again. And as I mentioned, in this pilot phase, we'll only be addressing the pathogenic genes identified out of the whole exome related to nuclear DNA. And again, we know that that um, leaves a, a portion of our, our patient community uh, on the sideline. If you have a mitochondrial DNA uh, mutation, um, it would not be detected in this process. Um, but for I think many of the people, if not most that are submitting, you don't know the basis of your disease. And so it may be nuclear, it may not be mitochondrial. At the end of the day, a negative result here does not mean you don't have mitochondrial disease. And I apologize if that's like a triple negative, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, this is one test. And as Dr. Larson talked about, it's one test that may be part of a series of tests to ultimately determine if you do indeed have a genetic form of, uh, of mitochondrial disease. Now, I'd mentioned our partner, Probably Genetic, and we're going to have a demonstration uh, by their chief technology officer, Lucas Berger, in a second. But I also want to mention the reason why we're able to offer this as a no-cost uh, program to the patient community is the generous sponsorship of Zogenix. Zogenix is developing a therapeutic for, for mitochondrial disease focused on TK2 deficiency. But their goal here is not to drive diagnoses of just TK2 patients, but rather aid the entire mitochondrial disease community, broadly diagnose mitochondrial disease patients. Perhaps uh, TK2 patients will emerge through the process, but that's not the primary goal. This is really meant, um, it's a recognition of the gap that existed between number of patients that know their diagnosis and, and those that, um, have the opportunity to, to get to a diagnosis by having access to a test. Um, so those are some of the uh, overarching parameters. I'm, I'm happy to talk about further details in the Q&A portion, but I do want to leave time for uh, Lucas to talk about what you can expect once you get to Probably Genetic and begin the program. So Lucas, if you can come on camera, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it over to you. All right. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, Phil, and thank you, Austin. That was a uh, fantastic description of genetic testing for mitochondrial disease. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Lucas Berger. It's great to talk with you today. Um, I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Probably Genetic. Um, so what I work on at the company is all of our different web applications and lab integrations and that sort of thing. Um, so if you've seen our symptom checker or patient portal, those are things which I've worked a lot on. Um, and I can answer any questions related to the program and the process, but I'm not a doctor, not a genetics researcher, so uh, not the best person to ask all of your scientific questions for. Um, cool. So today I'll discuss um, what you'll get from participating in our program, um, sort of what the, what the process is for participating, um, what different steps you need to go through to get your um, final lab report, um, and a little sneak peek of some of the results of the program. Cool. Um, so what you'll get from the program. So um, probably genetic will offer a uh, sort of whole exome sequencing test, which, uh, as was just mentioned, covers the nuclear portion of the of the genome. Um, and so this is an image of what like the probably genetic test sort of looks like. Um, we are the whole process is fully HIPAA compliant, uh, CLIA certified and CAP accredited. Um, and uh, because this is a clinical test, um, in order to get your test, you need, your order will be reviewed um, and ordered by physicians um, who create sort of the, the test request form for your test. Um, and then finally, um, at the end, you will get a lab report, which will show um, what variants we found on your, in your DNA that might be disease causing or, um, or potentially a negative report. Um, and you'll be able to discuss this report with one of our genetic counselors. So um, you'll be able to schedule a 60 minute um, genetic counseling session with um, over the phone or over Zoom to discuss, uh, to discuss like ex explaining the results and the limitations of the test, um, explaining the hereditary nature of, of your variants if, if some are found. Um, and potentially suggesting specialists um, to see based off of your results. Great. Um, so that's that's what you get out of the program. Um, the The process for participating participating in the program is a uh, four step process. And so to begin with, um, if you want to learn more about the program, you can go to uh, umdf.org/testing to learn all about the program. There's an FAQ there which should answer most of your questions. Um, as Phil mentioned, um, this program is aimed to help patients who have not received um, whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing in the past. Um, and so for these patients that haven't had these testing, um, for eligible patients, we aim to provide no cost at home genetic testing. Um, so, um, and, and then also at this time, we're only able to offer testing to uh, patients in the United States. So after learning a bit more about the program, um, you can click Get Started on the UMDF website. Um, and then from there, you'll move over to the probably genetic side of the program. Um, and you'll see our symptom checker. And so on the symptom checker, um, which should only take five minutes or less to complete, um, we'll ask you a number of questions. So firstly, who are you taking uh, this symptom checker for? So if you are a parent taking this for your child, you can indicate that there, or you can uh, indicate that you're taking it for someone else, say a different family member or even a friend. Um, from there, we'll ask more questions about your, your background, such as your age, um, when you started experiencing your symptoms, um, your sex, um, and we'll ask about uh, more medical topics. So we'll ask about uh, what are your prior diagnoses? Um, which, what symptoms do you experience? And so what all of this information is used for is to um, sort of, it's used by our machine learning algorithm to decide whether the patient is eligible or not. Um, and a, a side effect of this is that as more and more patients uh, complete the symptom checker, um, we're building up what's known as like our training data set for, for the machine learning algorithm to better learn how to detect patients um, who are undiagnosed. So hopefully in the future, as we collect more and more responses, we'll be able to build a really great tool for um, detecting mitochondrial disease in undiagnosed patients. So after completing the symptom checker, um, you'll enter your email so that we can contact you in the future. Um, and uh, after that process, um, we will review your application. Um, the machine learning algorithm will flag patients who, who are eligible. Um, and if you are deemed eligible, um, you'll receive an email um, instructing you on how to claim your test. Um, so once you uh, claim your test, essentially all you need to do is add in your shipping information 
Um, and from there, you'll be asked to complete the intake questionnaire. Um, and so the intake questionnaire is a bit longer than the symptom checker. Uh, it takes around 15 to 25 minutes to complete. Um, and the intake questionnaire is uh, very important. And in it, you'll have to enter a bit more detailed information on your medical history and also family history. Um, and this information is used by the doctor who I mentioned previously, who has to uh, prescribe your test um, and bioinformatician. So these are the people um, working on analyzing your DNA um, in, the, in the way that Austin mentioned earlier. Um, and so essentially what they do is they look at the raw genetic data um, and they, they try to find um, pathogenic uh, mutations or VUSs. Um, and they do this based off of things um, like Nomad, um, like other known mutations. And, um, and then in the end, we create the, the lab report from that information. Um, and so, um, so once, once the intake questionnaire is completed, um, and if the doctor approves your test, a kit is shipped to your home. Um, it's super simple from there. All you need to do is provide a saliva sample, um, which we have a great video demonstration on how to do. Um, one important thing to note is before providing the saliva sample, make sure not to eat, drink, smoke, or brush your teeth uh, within an hour of providing the sample. Um, and so, and then from there, after uh, providing the sample, um, you can return your kit to any USPS drop-off center um, and our lab will receive the kit, um, sequence your DNA, um, analyze it, um, and we'll produce the result report, which you can find in your patient dashboard. Um, from there, you can schedule your 60 minute genetic uh, counseling session over the phone or Zoom and discuss your results. So, so far we've had a really great uh, response from the program. Um, so we've, we've, uh, we've found, uh, we've received responses from patients with, from over 30 disease groups. So you can see some of them here. Um, and we've received results from almost every state in the United States, which, which is incredibly exciting. Um, in the next few weeks, um, some of the patients will start to receive their results and start getting um, some answers to their unexplained symptoms. Um, Right. So again, here is the link for testing. So um, if you follow this link, you can read up on the program, um, apply for testing and a, potentially receive a lab uh, test kit in the mail immediately after. Um, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me personally um, at my email, lucas.berger at probabilgenetic.com. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again. Oh, fantastic. Uh, th thanks so much, uh, Lucas, for that. And um, Austin, thanks for coming back on too. We, we do have some time left for, for Q&A. Um, as I said, there's some uh, great questions already uh, queued up inside the uh, Q&A, uh, but there's still time to submit more and we'll get to as many as, as possible. Uh, Lucas, I'm actually going to start with you because we were just talking about the process of the, of, of the program. And you know, there, there was a question around um, someone will get back to you in several weeks, uh, you know, managing expectations of when those who submit can expect to hear a, a communication from probably genetic. I know there's been some variability to that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we've received an overwhelming response from patients. So there's been a bit of a backlog and delay in our response to patients, unfortunately. Um, if you have not received a response so far saying that you are eligible, um, that means you haven't been um, uh, offered a test among the first batch of offers. Um, and so you will, uh, we'll, we'll send you another uh, communication in the next month, um, letting you know if you have uh, received uh, the next batch or if you are still uh, haven't been uh, found to be eligible. Well, you're, you're very kindly kind of taking the, uh, you know, the, the responsibility for that. But I know it's also been some discussion too. Like we've been so pleased uh, as well by the response that we wanted to have a dialogue with you as a partner about, uh, you know, who to offer the test to, how can we uh, expand uh, to, to offer as many as possible, and it's taken some time to work through those things. So uh, again, thank you for your partnership on this. To the patient community, uh, we just recently had a meeting, you know, internally where he said, we, we really need to up our communications on this. And so there's a commitment now for everyone that submits to know where they stand and to get regular updates. Um, you may not be a candidate in the, in the first pass, uh, but depending on how many uh, candidates we have and sort of the goals of the program, there's still a chance you may be offered. 
And so, Lucas, just the, assuming once a person is in and the sample comes back, um, rough timeline for having results that are being returned uh, to, to the patients after that? Yeah, so after, after the sample comes in um, and we, we receive your sample, it roughly takes four to six weeks to actually get the result report. So. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, for those of you who perhaps already have, um, have submitted and have been selected and maybe you've even uh, received a kit and, you know, and sent it back because we know some of those are uh, in, in process, probably Genetic has a really nice uh, dashboard for this. Um, it should be, yeah, somewhere in six weeks or so, right? A month, six weeks that uh, some of those initial reports will, will be coming back. So we, we ask for your patience. Um, we have been really excited by the, the, the number of, of submissions that have come in, um, and it's going to provide a lot of data that will help us to make good decisions about how we can sustain this program and make it even more valuable uh, going forward. Um, so, uh, yeah, Austin, you know, a lot, a lot of questions. I know you've uh, jumped on and addressed a few of them, uh, but um, you know, th th this is a common one that I think, you know, that we, we hear uh, in, in the community. You know, my physician suspects I have mitochondrial disease. Um, you know, I'm reluctant to do a muscle biopsy. You know, is there, is, can genetic test really, you know, get me to a diagnosis of mitochondrial disease or, you know, maybe help a patient that might be in that kind of situation? Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a genetic test uh, is not 100% sensitive. So um, there's, there's, uh, it's hard to imagine a scenario where uh, a doctor would say this genetic test is completely definitive and we're never going to consider any other information. Um, that said, um, the genetic testing is very good in some circumstances and does have uh, high sensitivity, um, especially if you're working with someone who understands the intricacies of which tissues might harbor an mtDNA mutation versus testing for um, nuclear mutations. Um, so uh, it's hard to answer in the abstract, but um, the, the genetic testing can be very helpful. Um, in the setting of um, symptoms that are less specific for mitochondrial disease, um, the likelihood of finding a specific diagnosis is lower. Um, but there's still, I think, value in giving doing a broad and unbiased look at which rare genetic variants are present and which may be contributing to symptoms. So, I'm a believer in the value of, of doing genetic testing, even if the clinical circumstances are less certain. And you know, to acknowledge up front that it, it, it may not give a definitive answer, right, at the end of that test, but it's, it's more information for you, know, you as a doctor and the, the healthcare team in general to go off of as you're trying to piece together this puzzle and, and, and give the best care and the best options to, to the patients. Yeah, and to put a, a slightly technical spin on this, so the, the negative predictive value of testing is useful to a clinician. So the, the fact that you looked for a mitochondrial disease with a, an appropriate test and you didn't find it, that's important information. That, that may be helpful to guide your clinicians to, to look at a different category of diseases. Fantastic. Um, uh, so the, there's another question that was actually uh, submitted uh, pr prior to the webcast. Um, you know, uh, we have a number of clinical trials taking place in mitochondrial disease now uh, that involve mitochondrial myopathies. And, you know, I think this is a good example where there may be some confusion. Uh, you know, we have certain syndromes like Lee syndrome and MILAS and, you know, all these acronyms associated with it. Um, but mitochondrial myopathy is a bit of a art, right, of, of piecing together. It, it fundamentally means muscle-based symptoms. But, uh, you know, is, is there any uh, guidance you can provide to um, our uh, patient base that may be interested in seeing whether genetic testing might make them eligible to participate in these clinical trials about the kinds of testing they should receive? Uh, yes. So, um... 
there are a variety of different genetic diagnoses that can result in myopathy. So myopathy means disease of the muscles. That's the literal definition of myopathy. Um, and there are dozens of different mitochondrial genetic conditions that can lead to myopathy. So uh, to uh, Phil, to your point, um, many of the, some of the clinical trials that are currently available require two things. They require a, a genetic diagnosis of mitochondrial disease and symptoms of myopathy. And those two things both have to be present for someone to be eligible. Right. Um, so uh, the, the nuclear testing that, that Lucas was talking about is that's a, that's a big chunk of the patients that have mitochondrial myopathies. It's really important to look at those nuclear uh, genes uh, and think about those diagnoses. But it's also really important to um, make sure that you're working with someone who, uh, again, understands the intricacies of where the mtDNA or mitochondrial DNA mutations can be found, which tissues are appropriate to test to look for mitochondrial DNA mutations. Uh, you know, the buccal swab is, is great. Uh, as, as you know, we looked at that paper, it's kind of mutation specific, but sometimes the, the urine can be a little bit mm -hmm. more likely to, to, uh, to show you that mutation. And the muscle biopsy is going to be the kind of the gold standard. That's going to be the, um, the tissue that is most likely to continue to have a detectable mutation later, you know, as life goes on. Um, in addition to that, there are other advantages of a muscle biopsy apart from genetic testing, like having a pathologist look under the microscope um, and do special stains on the muscle. And, you know, th there's a lot of other information that can be gained by that. Um, so if someone has myopathy, um, there's a lot of value in, in working with someone, usually a neuromuscular neurologist who is a, a specialist in the symptom of myopathy and considering both mitochondrial disease as well as other causes of myopathy if you're as of yet undiagnosed. Yeah, really important. Right? You know, again, many of these uh, you know, clinician-based answers always end with you need to have a conversation with your healthcare provider right, about your situation, your symptoms, and how they fit um, of, overall, particularly when it comes to potential participation in a, in a clinical trial. Um, so we, we have time for maybe a couple more. And Lucas, I, I'd like to come back to you. Um, we're, you know, we're we're into this program now. You know, about a month or so. Um, you know, I, I think it's really important for the mitochondrial disease community and the and, and those that are the patients, uh, caregivers that are on this um, webinar tonight to kind of understand this process a, a little bit deeper about how selections are being made. It's not UMDF making a decision about who should receive a test. It's not even you, right? a person uh, at, at uh, probably genetic that's making this decision. Uh, but it starts first and foremost with a algorithm that was developed, right, using machine learning and how we trained that. Maybe you could just briefly talk about that and why this is such an exciting new way to potentially diagnose patients. Yeah, definitely. So to, to shed a bit more color on that. So the, the, the mechanism for deciding who is eligible for these patients um, is sort of twofold. So the first one is to uh, determine if they're uh, excluded or not. And so Phil and I sort of mentioned this already. If right. you've had whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing, or if you're not in the United States, uh, you are uh, not uh, eligible for testing. Um, and then the, the second layer is that uh, we have this machine learning algorithm um, which uh, essentially uh, decides how, or it has sort of a confidence score for how likely um, it thinks that a given patient has mitochondrial disease. Um, and, and the way that works is um, we start by um, collecting a number of training samples. So um, maybe some people on the call were, were part of this uh, over the summer. So um, we collected, I think, uh, over about 120. About 120, yeah, of, of patients who we knew had confirmed molecular 
uh, diagnoses for different mitochondrial diseases. And what we could do, and, and, and they filled out the exact same symptom checker that you may have seen. Um, and what we, what we can do with that information is we can see sort of, or, or the, the algorithm can kind of learn the mapping between symptoms and diagnoses and see how uh, patients of a given, uh, with a given diagnosis might, might fill out the symptom checker. Um, and in that way, it can uh, sort of build like a similarity score for how similar a new patient seems to a diagnosed patient. And so the way that we're, we use that to um, offer tests is um, we, we select the patients that seem most likely to have a molecular diagnosis that could be picked up by our whole exome sequencing test. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's really uh, an exciting development. I think you can see what we're trying to accomplish here. Right? Put the decision in the hands of the patients to provide information about themselves and hopefully be able to prove out that this methodology of using an algorithm can make good decisions about those who are good candidates. It's not making a diagnosis. It's, it's trying to identify who are the best candidates to get testing. The genetic test will speak for itself ultimately uh, in determining um, um, what the, the, the diagnosis is. Uh, but uh, if, if it can be demonstrated to be effective, this really opens up a, a whole new avenue for being able to, in a very uh, simple way, drive a lot of diagnoses for our patient community. So the, the coming months will be really exciting uh, with the program. And uh, again, we, we, we thank you, uh, Lucas, and, and probably Genetic uh, for your partnership on this. Um, uh, it's off to a great start. Uh, often, uh, I think we're going to come to you with the you know, final sort of wrap-up question tonight. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of taking in uh, the questions from the Q&A and what were submitted. And you can see that you know, so many of our, uh, our, from our community have been on this diagnostic journey for, for many, many years. And, and maybe it started with some blood tests and then it moved to a muscle biopsy. Maybe they've had a panel. Heck, they may have even had next generation sequencing, but you know, answers are still elude. Uh, but there's still a message of hope here that I'm, uh, I'm hoping that you can convey. And that's that technology continues to advance. And where do you see the field going? Um, you, you, you talked a little bit about this in there, right, towards whole genome, but where do you see it moving that gives you confidence that it's going to become easier and easier to make a diagnosis of mitochondrial disease using genetic testing? Yeah, uh, there's so many places to go with that, uh, <laughs> with that question. Well, um, we don't have that much time, but yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a couple things going on that I'll point to. So one is that we are uh, characterizing the medical significance of a larger and larger number of genes. So each year we know about 200 to 300 more genes right. that have clinical yeah. significance. Ne nearly one a day, right? Yep. Yeah. And a, a significant fraction of those are mitochondrial genes. So we, we continue to identify new gene disease correlates. And the more of those that we identify, the better the test gets. Um, the other thing is that the, the actual um, testing techniques are improving. So. Mm -hmm. You know, a whole exome, you know, I have patients that have had whole exome sequencing in, say, 2014, 2015. That's a very different test than it is now. Um, so the, the test is just much more sensitive for um, a wider variety of different, different ways that the DNA can be modified. So this, this gets into a kind of a technical topic, but um, you can have expansions and contractions of, of areas of DNA. You can have rearrangements, so it, just an area can be flipped around with no other changes. And you know, for technical reasons, things other than just changing one letter to a, or changing one base to another base, if you do almost anything else, it gets kind of hard to to pull that information out of the data that you're generating. So. Um, we're doing things like long read sequencing, um, and, and that will give us new insights into the types of genetic variation, even in genes that we already know about, new types of variation that are associated with diseases. Um, so the, the diagnostic yield of this testing keeps going up with time. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a decade into uh, using these tests, you know, on basically a daily basis. I'm not perceiving that that we're at a at a plateau or at a ceiling. Um, 
And, um, you know, I'm excited to see what, you know, what each new generation of analysis and what each new generation of testing technologies brings. And I, and I really hope, um, and I think that we will be able to accurately diagnose a larger and larger fraction of the patients that have mitochondrial disease. Yeah, um, uh, I, I agree. And you know, I, I, again, I hope for our patient community that that it that is a message that resonates that this is still emerging, um, and access to it, uh, various approaches to it, such as what probably genetic is using, are, are still uh, in the early days. So um, UMDF is committed. Uh, to finding the partners and developing the programs that can yield as many diagnoses as possible for, for our patient uh, community. We hope to be able to share with you additional programs in the near future that will expand um, the, the capabilities. So please stay tuned for details on, on that front too. Uh, for tonight, I, I think it's time to bring it to a close. Again, thank you, uh, Dr. Larson, for sharing your time, your expertise. Uh, thank you for taking care of our patients. Uh, Lucas, uh, for your contributions from the probably genetic side, uh, and to our audience for uh, the great questions that were submitted as well. Um, thank you, uh, everyone. And a reminder that we will be back in March talking about the voice of the patient, another really important topic as it relates to the development of uh, treatments and cures. So uh, look forward to seeing you all again uh, next month. Have a good night.